Welcome to another episode of GSP, the Good Trigger Podcast. I am Ralph Sutton. With me, as always, Marcus and Tebby. If you're new to the show, very simple. A, it started out trying to make me better, putting me in a better place mentally, physically, and we hope perhaps you pick up some of those lessons too. Maybe we inspire you. Maybe we don't. You can pick and choose what you take from this podcast, but we hope we're doing something a little bit better for the universe. How are what you? What about Marcus? me? What about me? I mean, isn't it making me better? I don't know. We don't really ever address that. I have that on my list of questions today, wow. by the way. Wow. Yeah, okay. You know, that. I think it's really important that um, I take a minute to express something to our audience, who I'm extremely grateful that people listen to us, and I thank everybody, and I hope that we're doing a good job. The thing that's on my mind a lot right now is my own personal mental recovery from uh life in general, right? I got, I, I really started my journey when I was 15 and I got sober. And um, I just think that it's really interesting that a lot of the stuff that I'm going through right now is 35 years of preparation mentally to dive into my childhood stuff. Mm -hmm. I've been reading about it, talking about it, understanding it. But it's been difficult for me to, to unlock certain stuff. I didn't have the tools. And I've been unlocking certain things. And um, it's been very liberating. And I write about it a lot. And, and I, I just want to say that the fastest path to happiness for the human mind is to take the painful journey back into the past once and for all and try to unlock the things that we have in holding patterns that are trapped, things that control our subconscious mind and put us into a gentle sleep where we're not really enjoying life to its fullest. And you know what? If we had a thousand years, guys, I would say waste all the time you can because it'll be pretty boring after you figure shit out. But we don't get that much time. And I'm, I'm glad to share uh, Ralph's journey with him because he's doing the work. We're going to go deeper with this guy. <laughs> all right. So let me ask you a question. Does that make any sense? Let me ask you a question. Okay. I started my timer a little bit late, like maybe six seconds late. When you off air, you said, when we go on, I have a, about a 40 second rant. Oh, Jesus. How long was it? Three I'm minutes? Curious, it was well, I said, one minute and 35 seconds, which is oh, that's pretty good for double, me. not that's horrible. That's pretty good. Right. You know, I always come in over, but I, I come in over budget by double. I like to do things in double. Okay. Well then, then you nailed it. There yeah. you go. Um, so here's the thing. And I'm just going to be honest with you. I, so often, I, I do believe, for mo I have a bunch of topics to get to, but we'll stick with what you brought up here. I do believe a lot of people, and I, and I can't say, I don't like to speak in absolutes ever. In life, I don't. That's an that. absolute right there. I just I, I, you know. I, that's funny. That's true. And I don't <laughs> like that. That's very true. But um, so you tend to, and I believe because it's also part of your life and maybe a lot of people you know, a lot of your issues stem from your childhood. I have read a lot of literature that says it's not for not everybody not necessarily everyone it's childhood <laughs> and i know you it's an easier button to put on it it's like oh everybody has childhood issues well i'm, I'm making a mistake then i'm saying how about take out the word childhood and say that you're simply a computer program that's been programmed since conception to the moment of birth to every successive day after that and we'll say the most forming years of your life where you create the most amount of your character structures is in the first 20 years. And so by childhood, I mean my forming years of my life, the events that shaped how I think, they're relevant because many of, my, many of them are great, Ralph. Many of them have got me to this place where I'm at right now. But a lot of them cause me trouble. And so I, could, I have adapted and worked over many of those things, but some of them still cause me too much trouble. And so the only way to fix it is to get under the hood and go into go in deep, and it's impossible for anyone to say that they have not been affected by the first most formative twenty years of their life. It would be completely antithetical to logic. No, I while I agree with that, I'm not saying that everybody has problems that are specifically related to how they were raised. I feel that it's more logical to say your past defines who you are. Where that past ends, I could debate you. Does that make any more sense? I don't. I think it would be foolish to debate. I think we we share similar values, and I think what we should do instead of debate is just over time 
talk it out because I think that it's difficult to put a lot of this into language. But I think if I'm given a slow period of time and I don't have to rant and rave or, you know, say too much, I just want to circle around the issue a hundred times with you over time so that you can really understand what I'm saying. Here's what I'm saying. Okay. In, in short, not everybody has severe trauma, which is obvious. There's a lot of right. very well adapted people out there. Phenomenal parents, great, everything, right? A lot of people, most of the world, but we all have little things that of have, imp- they all have impacted us. Now they're little, a guy, you know, you, you're a very well-adjusted guy. Yeah, of course, you have your idiosyncrasies. You know, every tree grows with a slightly crooked bend to it. Nothing. Why do you, you got to bring my penis into this? I know, right. But if you think about it, the things that you know about yourself that you want to fix, they have either not been taught to you in the first place, so it's not related to childhood. It's just simply missing. Mm-hmm. Or there's something there some impression that you have, some marketing and branding. Get closer to your mic, please. Some type of marketing and branding that you had embedded in your head that shapes the way you think about that thing. So why not go into the subconscious mind? By the way, you're a science guy. Psychology is a really modern thing. You know, it's like a couple of thousand years old. Just like in the health industry with a lot of food contradictions in that community, I read and see a lot of contradiction in Absolutely. the psychological community. Absolutely. So that's just it. it is what it is. Like, yeah, hey, I are agree. You, hey, are you perfect? Well, depends on who you no, are. No, seriously. Who you, is? Nobody's perfect. Exactly. So how can science be perfect? It, there right. has to be mistakes. The idea is this. Put science aside. Let's just be me and you talking about ourselves, about our childhoods. Forget everybody else. Who cares? There's nobody listening. Just me talking to you and I'm saying, I know for a fact that you had so many positive things in your childhood. I saw them. Yeah, oh, for sure. I think and I had you, a pretty pretty good childhood for the did. most part. I think yeah, you did. I, I, I think did. you did. And now we would say what what's re- the symptoms in your life reflect how good your childhood is, which is you don't have that many symptoms. Right. I, you it's understand funny what I'm saying? That, yeah, in, you, have, in, uh, you, have, you have, like everyone else, no judgment. You have maybe three or four serious symptoms. Right. Three or say. four serious ones. I would like to hear what you think your three or four serious symptoms of problems that happened in your childhood are. Let's see. Wait, 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 I'm not trying to understand the question. Are you asking me my current problems that are related to things that happened? I I would say I I would ask you if we're looking at let's I want to use the right word. If we look at a maladaptive behavior, something that causes right. you... That, and you think that I, that I Wait, believe me, is related me, to my past. Let me go. It's something that probably does not maximize your happiness. It's probably something that causes low-level anxiety or vibration of fear, if you really stood it, studied it. And it's probably something you've looked at before and said, okay, that's there. So there ha- it has to be three or four of them, right? Yeah, what do you, yeah. what, and, and you know that they're directly linked to oh, for sure. I can, so The perception. first two that have jumped out, well, there's three. The first two that jump out right away is obviously fear of intimacy relationship. That's obvi- an obvious one. That's be idiotic to not see that one. And while Where did one, might, one might suggest it came from both of my pa- my parents getting divorced when I was three or four, rather, and both of them dating, serial dating, you know, but while I'm not sure that's the reasoning, I have, because I have a lot of friends who had the same upbringing with, like, look at my cousin, Ralph, who... His parents split when he was young. They both were dating other people, and he's been married forever. So I can't say that. Right. That's so, definitely- so that it goes back to the story of the father of two sons, and the guy, the father is a horrible alcoholic, and he dies from alcoholism. And someone is talking to the sons at the funeral, and uh, one son um, is asked, "Do you drink?" And he says, "No." And, the, and someone says, "Why not?" He says, "Look at my father." Right. And the other son. Uh, says do you drink he says all the time and they say why do you do that he says look at my father right but then but so then you, everybody has different adaptations right but hold me interrupt you then you could blame every single thing on you, the, the past like if your parents it's are in not, relation it's not the wrong right word it's not blame or no no sorry a tribute wait wait it's like a computer program you just what you're saying is silly because imagine I'm using a computer and I'm typing with it and the letters are working perfect and the program is perfect. One could look at it and say it's because everything that was programmed it programmed in it from A to Z. That's what you see. 
you see what's been programmed me programmed in me even up to yesterday because it's not just your childhood that shapes you you could have traumas when you're an adult so the idea is to try to look at these things and figure out how they affect you and then right your mic i'm sorry mark is your mic for some reason is sorry. off today there you go then work to find a rational resolution to the, like you just said a fear of intimacy i think that's really important that you said that because I don't think it's just from your childhood. I think it's natural. Right. I, yeah, As, I don't also, by the way, this is a weird thing to say because it's so counterculture, but <coughs> I'm very happy alone. I make myself laugh. I'm very comfortable. I don't nothing feel a need. That. You know, I enjoy, sometimes there's nothing, the feeling of coming home at night, especially in a day when you're like at work and you're with a hundred people all day and whatever, the idea of going home and sitting in silence and having no one else how around long, me. How long have you been, how, how often are you having uh, sex? With uh, other than yourself, four. You know, it's funny. I went to a doctor the other day, and um, here comes a joke, guys. Here comes a, a joke <laughs> for a physical. <laughs> That's an opening. Of, God damn it! You ruined it. They went Sorry. to the doctor for a physical, and he said, uh, I'm, Mr. "I think you should probably stop masturbating." I said, "Why? Is nothing not? Is not?" He goes, "No, because I'm trying to examine you." It's really funny. Thank you. So, um, um, I would say realistically, so, so how often? Three times a week. Okay, so you're not alone. You're in a relationship of a certain type. It's right. not like you're doing celibacy and solitude. You have, you but there have, could be weeks that go with nothing. But, I, but I'm that's not that it. much. Right. I don't think. I don't think for a guy, for guys our age. I mean, once you're past the age of thirty and you've had sex a few times, it's not the end of the world if you go a month, or two, a year. You know, right. yeah, we have some, we have some other things to take care of in life. But you're, right. I, I feel like you're not really in solitude. You don't really have an opportunity at this moment to delve into that type of isolative uh, loneliness. Right. I guess that's true. I mean, I do enjoy maybe because it's not happening so many successive days in a row. The idea of just like sometimes the joy of just being in getting in bed at around 11, 30, 12 o'clock at night by myself in silence. Sometimes it just, I start laughing. I'm like so happy that I'm in bed and not have to deal with anything. You know, like you said, all right, don't brag so much. All right. right, That's number one. So no, I think set. I think that's great. I think that's that's you. You're finding yourself. I also like to go to movies alone. I go eat alone. I'm it just makes saying me happy. you're 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 a self sufficient guy. I mean, you know, you're pretty high level in so many different ways of how you take care of yourself. Now, what you said was really important, which is fear of intimacy. Well, I don't think it's just from what you are seeing in your childhood. I think it's what you see in society. I think you expose yourself to a certain lifestyle. For how long were you working in? The nightlife? I mean, by nightlife, if you're including nightclubs. I'm talking uh, about everything. Strip clubs? I mean, nightclubs, I started, and the first nightclub I worked at was 17. When I got out of strip clubs, I was 34. Okay. That's a really long time for you to be surrounded by a certain type of sexuality. Yeah. So that influenced you, too, as well. And then, look, I'm not criticizing it. Let's just say, overall, if you were to rate the time that you spent in nightlife, I'm talking about what the women's that you women's tens of women's the women that you knew. I would probably say that you feel good about what you experienced in your life. I mean, I don't look back and high five myself for who I had sex with, but I'm saying is that I uh, oh there was some bad, really bad moments. I just mean that it's it's a weird thing. I don't. Did you have, did um, you have some really really bad when you look down and you go, oh my god, what am only I doing? Only if, if it seems a little uh, chauvinistic <laughs> or, or, or misogynistic, but. Uh, the dumbest thing I ever did is when I was 20. You know, this is stupid. I made a dumb goal to sleep with 21 women before I turned 21. <laughs> You're just stupid. You're 21. You know, I was 20 years old. And I missed it by, by like a week. But by the end of that, I really was just like, whatever will happen will happen. I definitely didn't need to be attracted to the girl for the last three or four to try and make that goal. But that's I, think, I think that it says, it says a lot about the culture, the nature of men. Right, but also it was a different time. It was 1990. It's a no, stupid time. I, I don't we know. look. You have to look at it from a whole picture and not just from one little thing. Yes, okay. it's a time that you were in. It's what your self esteem is like. It's what your friends are doing. It's what you think people will respect you for. It's for just simply the pleasure of it. I mean, young people right. don't resist temptation. Of course, I mean, you know, if you put 187 women in front of 27 uh, year old Ralph Sutton. 
it, you, you know, you'd you'd have you'd go out and buy 187 Look out, pounds. Look ladies. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah. The, I, listen, there's a lot, a lot to uncover in that without being judgmental because I think you're a very emotional guy. I think you're very sensitive. And I think that in this chapter of your life that you should, because you don't, you've gotten laid a million and a half times, it could be a good um, contrast for you to do some deep diving and explore what you think long-term relationships could be like today for you, who you'd like to attract, you know, having some kind of game plan. Because by the way, in all, in all seriousness, you know, my birthday is in about a month and a half as we're taping this. Oh my God. Uh, I'll be 52. And, uh, a lot has happened this year towards the positive, I believe, in terms of my life, not just uh, health wise, but totally, you know, a lot of other things that have been going my way. And I did say just the other day to my brother, perhaps this is the year that, you know, you and I find people that really we enjoy their company and spend so you like time that. with them. So you like that idea? I do love the idea. I just find myself, you know, you could argue maybe I attract the wrong type of woman. Maybe I'm attracted to the wrong type of woman. Maybe I get turned off too easily. You can make a hundred different lists of why or, ha- or it's, ha- it's habits. The lists are yeah. helpful. They're, they, listen, the lists are helpful for a moment so that you can just recognize for yourself as an intelligent, mechanical person. You can see very clearly all the aspects of your repetition and your patterns and right. say, okay, you're a smart guy. You're, you're 52. I don't like this pattern. I don't like that. Yeah. And I mean, then, that just happened. I would like to interrupt you, but I just, just a quick side story. And then yeah. I, so I met a girl on Instagram, which is how I meet a lot of girls these days. It's just, I don't go out to bars or clubs or whatever. I do my yoga at home. I do, you know, I train solo. So I'm not meeting people in a gym, whatever. I work at the same office all the time. So Instagram, Facebook allows me to meet people that I wouldn't normally come in contact with. So we made plans. I always ask this question. Once we decide we're going to dinner, do you have any dietary restrictions that I should know about? Because I think that's, that's a nice way because people are vegan, people are gluten-free, people, whatever. And I'll eat anywhere. I don't care. She goes, absolutely not. Anywhere is fine with me. Cool. Love that answer. Some girls sometimes write, take me to Tao or take me whatever. And that's a deal breaker for me. Like, oh, she already has sets, ideas in mind, whatever. I make a, pl- a reservation. I find out where she lives so I can send her an Uber because I'm a gentleman. And she's about 30 minutes away. She lives on the Upper West Side. And I made a reservation. We talked that morning. And I said, all right, be ready by like 7 o'clock. Dinner's at 7.30. Okay. 7.05, I text her, are you almost ready? 7.15, she writes back, no, right? Which is now a little weird. 7.30, now when our reservation is supposed to happen, roughly, I'm fucking up the times a little bit, she texts me back and says, hey, I just looked at the, um, at the menu of your restaurant you picked, and I'm not feeling it. Can we go somewhere else? So in my head, the girl's now a half hour late. I think the reservation was like 10 minutes from then, whenever it was. We're not going to be on time. You're now telling me you want to go somewhere else. I felt it was insulting. She doesn't care about the time. She doesn't care about anything but herself. So I text back and say, look, you're, you're 35, 40 minutes late. You're changing the restaurant at the last minute. You didn't even seem to care that you're, you're late. Why don't we take this as pulling the plug, red flags for me. We'll call it a night. It was nice almost meeting you. No harm, no foul, no worries, right? She then calls me and starts screaming at me that I'm an asshole for, uh, canceling on her she just wanted to go somewhere else last minute blah 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 i said look you're yelling at me and we don't even know each other you don't see that as enough of a reason not to get together she says whatever hangs up on me blocks me on instagram and we never spoke again excuse me um look i think it's a great story and i think you have about ten thousand of those stories in your arsenal mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um but I think the, because she was so pretty, right. five years ago, Ralph would have just said, yeah, sure, we'll book somewhere else. What, what if I just said, listen, bro, you're, f- you're fishing in polluted waters. Well, I don't, look, I'm not going to, I don't go do much else. You know what it's I mean? That, I you don't, you don't, the, the work is inside your house, inside your mind first. It's not outside. It's not where you go. You're, you're, like I said, you're going to be 52. It's not like you're in a rush right now and you have to go out Monday through Friday to secure your supply. It's not what we're saying. Right. We're talking, what we're talking about is take a step back and first make a commitment to get out of a loop and say, you know what? Okay. I'm going to go for, for you three months, no dating, no sex. What? 
In fact, I would even try to go for three months. I'd say go for three months without slapping your pee pee. Watch your mouth. Uh, well, you, you, at 52, what do you think is going to be accomplished by that? I'm well, really you know curious. What? First of all, first of all, I know because I've done this many times. Yeah, because look at your ugly face. Pow, pow. OK, thank you. You know what they say? When ignorance hears the truth, <laughs> they humiliate it. They mock it. They make fun of it first. Are you right? talking about okay. yourself there? Okay, keep going. Just listen to what I'm saying, Dodo Bird, okay? <laughs> Such a stupid question. What do you think? It sounds like a little kid saying, I'm just curious. Why what do you think will be? A, what do you think is going to be accomplished? Where do you think? For, let's say pretend thing, three months from now, what's going to happen? The first thing. I'm going to come in a robe? No, not at all. Nothing is going to happen. If you're a dumb guy, you're just going to sit there, and go scratch your head. And then at the end, you're going to have a wet dream and come in your pants. OK, you, you, what you're saying is you want to see what comes up for you. You're a unique person. You want to see if uh, if it's purely just skin hunger that you crave. You could you can write that down and say, look, I'm a horny guy. I got to get laid all the time and really experience it. Three Are you months. saying no dates either? Like not even nothing. Uh, nothing. Not saying no sex or kissing or anything. I'm saying not even go out socially. No dates. No, you could go out with your friends. You're not. You're, it's not the kind of fast. You're talking about letting go of romantic interest to reset and to start over again. Three months is actually, and anybody who listening to this who's experienced this knows, it's not even that long of a period of time. I did three years by choice in a period of my life, and it wasn't because there weren't opportunities. It was because... I was just shell shocked and damaged. I couldn't handle any more noise. And so it just came to pass that I would concentrate on other aspects of my life. And I developed a sense of solitude. And I, and I would say the second time I did one like that, which was a shorter period of time, I also learned that you could go for too long and create um, like sexual and, and social anorexia. And then, that led to like a binge where you just go out and you're just like doing anything. No matter right, at least that's for your, your experience. That's what that's, I been, that's what I'm saying. It's, it's, it's unique to everybody. Right. Yeah. And, I, and I would say that certainly if you're looking to pass through a doorway and go into a new level, try something new and drastic because you're well, not 23, you're 52, which means I'll be 52. You're, you're 52. You're in the 50. Well, technically you're 52. You're actually, this is, you're 15. This yeah, is the are. most important thing. Yeah. You're not, you're running out of time. I get you. No, for you got to sure. you got to you got to get the hustle going right. here so that so well, that can we can we have that conversation after my birthday no. on New Year's Eve? Yes. OK, fair enough. So now you asked me three. I say number two. And I know where this comes from. The other thing you asked me about my issues. Right. Yes. So when we were you're, kids, you're a serial killer, when we were kids, my, my brother, myself and my cousin Ralph would always be together. They called the small, <laughs> medium and large little Ralph, my brother and I, because I was the tallest. And I just think it's a... Um, You're a venti. Yes. It was the... Um, I think it's that people instinctually think that the taller you are, like the more mature you are. Even though I wasn't any more mature than my brother. <laughs> you know, I looked bigger. So they assumed, both my parents and my uncle, assumed I was more a responsible, more mature adult. I don't think I was. I think that they put that on me because I was bigger. You know? So all of the responsibilities of when we were ch children was... They would, my nickname with my cousin and my brother was Responsible Ralph because they would always ask me to do it. Then I felt obligated to do it because they asked me to do it. And I think at this point in my life, it's also why I felt so compelled to take care of my uncle, why I felt so compelled to be there every day for my father. I feel that it is like ingrained in me to do the right thing. Oh, yeah, but I don't think it's just the ingrained. I think it's your nature. I think the reason why your parents relied on you is that at that period of time, there must have been something special about you and something that I you don't know. Could handle. I, again, I think it's because I was bigger. I really believe that. I don't think it was anything else. I don't know. I don't well, know. The evidence is, is that you're a hyper intelligent guy today. You've always been a hyper intelligent <laughs> guy. I'm assuming that you were a hyper intelligent little baby and a hyper intelligent toddler, teenager, etc. And I think that well, yes, it's it's conditioned into you, but it's probably a little bit to do about your actual composition of who you are. You're a natural leader. You're a natural problem solver. So I think it's a see. Here is where I'm taking your other side that you have that you don't think everything is childhood related, and I'm saying some of it's just your nature. Right. Well, I think I think it's possible. Like I remember there had been there was a time. This is a little off topic, but I was probably 
12. And my mother and brother were gone. I don't know why they were in the house. And then the toilet overflowed in the upstairs bathroom. And I didn't know how to turn it off. I'd never experienced that before, you know, and I couldn't figure it out. And there's no internet to look things up. There was nobody to call. And it starts coming down, not only, you know, through the stairs and everything, but so much so that the kitchen below the light above filled with water and went crashing down on the seat. Like it was like a scene in a movie. Right. And I finally figured out how to turn the water off like 20 minutes in 30 minutes in and then cleaned up everything, figured out how to use the laundry machine, put the lights back, wiped everything down. And when my mother came home, they had no idea anything was wrong. And when I told her afterwards, she couldn't believe it. So I think you're right in that even at a younger age, I always figured out how to solve things and do problems. But I do feel sometimes I don't like that. And I don't know how to, if it's bad or good, I feel so compelled to do what would be perceived, at least in my head, as the right thing, sometimes to my own detriment. And I would use my uncle who, who passed this year as, a, as an experience on that, in that I was going to see him two days a week because I felt so bad knowing that if I don't go, no one else is going to see him. And I just couldn't sleep knowing that. Well, that's a, that's a fine quality in you. Maybe. I, think, I don't well, know. I think, I think I would face it as a fine quality in you. And I think there might be some areas where you cross over a line and it becomes more neurotic or compulsive. But I wouldn't overanalyze that at this moment because there's bigger fish to fry. What I would say when I maybe you could relate to this in some ways is that because we both come from homes where our parents separated and we have a lot of similarities in our childhood. Both of our mothers and fathers married young at, from a, from a, a, the Syrian Jewish community. Uh, people were compelled to get married. It was a social norm, uh, less about love and maturity, less about intimacy. And I would say that when I really think about it is that it's not just what happened to me in my childhood. It's that at a very early age, I saw my mother suffer. I saw mm -hmm. her grief and her sadness. And so I absorbed her suffering in a very complex way in the hopes that I could save her so that she would be there to nurture and love me or I would die. I know those connections. They're not things that I read anywhere. Right. I feel them. I feel what weight it put on me. And I, I, I talk about it. I write about it. And I set a lot of it free as a, as a, as a, as a grown up. I, I set it free. The other things that I, that I think about our childhood that are similar is that um, we, we just grew up sort of in a very strange, very brutal, very not natural to humanity period of time. We grew up in urban environments. Our parents were pursuing money. Everything was about technology and progress. Mm. The schools that we went to, I don't think that we had enough time to be part of a nurturing community, to really embrace nature and learn about nature, to be close to it. I don't think that we had enough time to see our parents happy. Yeah, I mean, my mom worked, us. both my parents worked, all, all they did was work. You know, it's crazy. <laughs> that was the 80s and 90s. That's what it was. You know, so if I was going to pick my third thing, there is that OCD that I have with like uh, everything, everything, right? That's for sure. Fuck and then my, my fourth, that's for sure. And I don't know if I think that's just hardwired into your brain. My dad I, had I, that I, also. I think you have to take away the word OCD and recognize what it actually is. It's a. It comes from the. Sh it comes from anxiety coupled with fucking intelligence. The two things together are a deadly mix because an intelligent purpose person sees deeper into things. It's a need for control. It's a need for a certain type of order because when things are out of control, that brings up the anxiety and the panic. And so some of it's very good, especially if you're a sea boat captain, a movie director. Uh, you know, I've done if, all those things. If you're uh, herding 300 heads of cattle, very, very good qualities. But when you're alone with yourself, it's just a distraction. Yeah, you know, it's funny. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to hold this up here. I have this charger uh, right here. If you can see it watching on YouTube. And very nice charger. I right before the show, I noticed it in front of me. What is that I charger? What what type of charger well, is that? I couldn't remember what it's for. Like, why do I have this charger? And I would not have comfortably been able to start the show. 
unless I realize what it's for. So I told our producer, Brian, I said, hang on one second. And I went around the house I'm like, what the fuck is it? And then I realized, oh, it's for the bone induction headphones that I just bought. And I would have been uncomfortable taping the show not knowing the answer to that question. I think you should see the bigger picture of it. The OCD is everywhere. When you said, when you talked about this woman that you had uh, that date encounter with, and you talk about red flags, and you talk about the pet peeves that you have and how people are have to, you know. Well, I'm sorry. Yes, but I'm sorry. Let me just say this, though, on that, is that if you're already 30 minutes late to a date and you don't even say, I'm sorry, that's a big red flag. I, I'm, not, I'm not referring just to her. I'm saying right. that I know for a fact that you would have a thousand red flags in the first four months. If we yeah. had the finances of a TV show and we could do like a dating thing where you pick four, you pick from four women and you start dating and the rule is you have to stay in it for two years and we're going to expose all your disasters. Right. You'll have to stay in it. You'll have 10,000 of those things because you're going to be there hyper vigilant, looking for everything that defines that per person. But as ha not being having suitable. said that, Marcus, there has been at least in the last five years, I would say five or six times when I was going out with a girl for like a month or two and thinking to myself, oh, this could be the one. This could be the girl that uh, I get really serious with. And then something happened. Well, I mean, you're saying that what on the first date? When no, you no, no, no. I said like dating them for like three, four, five months and feel okay. like, oh, this is this could be the one. OK. And so I just think that I think this is my opinion. If you want to become a master of this instead of being surprised by that and letting it happen again, plan it and predict it, saying I'm going to meet someone great. And three to five or six months in, there's going to be some big blockages. And instead of them ending it or me ending it or mutually, we're going to actually try to work it through with someone who could help you. Literally, mm -hmm. like someone that could say, okay, I'm well, listening to you two both. Here's what's going on. Because what will happen is you'll either separate because you'll go, wow, that person is horrible. Or you'll realize that the thing that you were having a lot of anxiety about wasn't that big of a deal. Or maybe, right, maybe, well, maybe you have interest, things in, in your character too. In the interest of full disclosure, the last time was right in the heart of the pandemic. There was a girl I was dating pretty regularly. We had gone on a few trips. We saw each other about once a week. And I was saying, oh, well, even my, my mother had met her and my mother liked her. Like, I really thought she was great. And then uh, on a weekend, she got pregnant by some other dude uh, that she barely knew. And then they decided to keep the baby. And now they're dating. So, hey, you know what? No that judgment. made for an awkward uh, time. No judgment. I'm just saying, I Look, felt that I, that meant that was I, I a wanna, sign that we probably shouldn't still be dating. I want to make a comment and just put the, keep the focus on Ralph Sutton. The comment Thanks. is, I have no judgment of her. The comment that I would make is that circumstance is obviously something that you, A, didn't care if it was happening in the background, B, did not know to look. And C did not set any boundaries. We didn't set. I, I never set boundaries. I don't. Well, you know what? Yeah. Maybe, maybe, maybe that statement. I'm saying maybe. You know, I put maybe seven times in front of this. Maybe it's time to think about setting some boundaries so that you can set the other person up to win, and you don't have to disappoint yourself, and also you don't have to waste three months of your life. It right. might really be a good thing to ask a person. If you go on a second date, that means that there's interest because there's no second date really, right? If right. there's no interest. So on the second date, when things are light and funny, uh, there, are, there are very clever and funny ways to bring up things that tell you a lot about that person. You might have done it on, not done it on the first date. It might have been too heavy. Like, for example, how come you're not in a relationship? Or what was your last relationship? You don't bring it up in a clinical way, obviously. You know what I'm talking about. I bring a questionnaire. Is that weird? You know what? It's actually funny. It's not weird. I saw someone do that on a on TikTok. Someone showed that they, on a right. date they were given a questionnaire. Well, at that's the, date, the whole premise of dating yeah. websites is a questionnaire that's trying to give you insight into that person's mind. Except it's also a marketing strategy, and so they leave out leave out vital stuff. Like they don't. There's no questions on Match.com or whatever people are using that say, "What are your five biggest character defects?" Now answer right. Answer truthfully. Uh, man, my penis is too gorgeous. I'm just, I'm just saying, think about the parameters by which people right. put out there to attract a mate. It's, it's completely random. And, and when you, I'm not saying that online dating is wrong. I'm saying when you go on an online date, the first date should be to establish physical attraction. And for you, you could say, 
it's really important to me because, and I'll tell you this, I'll agree. It shows that a person is really in reality when they know how to show up at 730. They're not floating off in space. Yeah, but even if, like, by the way, I don't mind if it's also one of my uh, dating little trickies that I always do is I tell a girl our dinner's at 730. I make the reservation for 745 because that gives us technically an extra half hour leeway. See, that's that's the dad. I like that. I like that kind of planning. Right. But I, so I don't want to get say, stressed. But if you're a half say, hour late, and you don't even say, hey, I'm sorry, I'm running late. I, I, it could be a person could do that because one, they're disinterested on the date or two, they're just really nervous. They got cold feet. It's it's right. a, could be a, a myriad system. of reasons. I agree right. with you. But the point is a person that you're going to be with has enough time to think about that and say, okay, look, I can be late because I'm nervous. I can be late because I don't really care. Or I could just show up because I made this fucking appointment. Right. And it's important to me. Otherwise, why am I doing this? And so you're, that's the first test is show up at 730. Yeah. If a person is highly enthusiastic, they'll be 10 minutes late. I mean, yeah, 10 well, minutes early. 10 minutes yeah, this, early. This, this girl was not enthusiastic. And now she blocked me. Whatever. It's okay. I don't care. It's fine. It's Listen, funny. It's okay. That's just where yeah. she's at. You know, I just, might... listen, I want to ask you a couple of quick questions. We're going to wrap. I like to keep these at about 40 minutes. Um, so uh, as we're taping this, Thanksgiving's right around the corner. My question first to you is, are you doing anything special with your family or no? We like to go in the woods and execute a couple of hundred turkeys just cool. for fun. Do you, do you have a tofurkey? Do you do anything like that? Or No, man. Uh, I appreciate it. I have my daughters, my, my beautiful daughters. I will have a nice just a nice meal prepared. All three are coming? Well, ba the baby Nova is with us all the time. I guess that's, that's really true. funny. Oh, okay. And she won't be partaking in the food. We'll probably make her a little uh, plate of blackberries. She loves blackberries. Mm -hmm. But I don't, I don't uh, make a tremendous deal out of it. Are, you, are your daughters vegan? Uh, you've asked me that before. I forgot the answer. Luna has tried it a couple of times on her own. And she goes back to eating. Uh, she always says it just tastes good. And I said, yeah, you know, do it. And, and Minnie's anti-vegan. Minnie actually said something really cute to me one time. She goes, um, I only want to eat meat. She, well, she said this, why are vegans so boring? I thought that'd be a great t-shirt. And, and, and one time she just said, we were talking about the desserts that her mom gets her and the desserts that I get her. And she said, your desserts are terrible. And I said, why? And she goes, because they're vegan. That's <laughs> All right, so that's, I'm going to have a, a Friendsgiving with my, my friend Tom that you know well and his uh, friends, about seven or eight of us Very getting nice. together. And then I want to say one of the cute story about you, and then we'll wrap it up, which is that um, my mom's friend, look at you and your guns. My mom's friend was reading a book the other day and was recommending it to my mom, and it was the Good Sugar book. Wow. Yeah, and she goes, I, I my really son does a it. podcast with him. And then that turned out they realized that uh, it was they were talking about the same person, which is kind of funny. So kudos to you and you know, giving your your book a plug. I know you don't like to talk really about anything it. ever, well, but you know it's not time. The, the good trigger dive. The book's out. How is it not time? Timing. That's, that's very brilliant. You that's know, brilliant. I didn't. I I published that book as a as a practice for myself. Okay. Same thing and, with me and my book. And the second thing is. Um, it is selling very well on the on on the Good Sugar website, and the third thing is so because it's selling well, I don't feel the need to promote it. And the third thing is that the main purpose of the book is when I open the store, I think a store like that has to have a comprehensive book to okay. to to back get, up the data. Well, also just to get people into the lifestyle, so it's more right. valuable for me to give that book to ten thousand guests. And I have them really buy into the program. You know what I'm saying? I got you. I like it. It's all about branding. All right. Follow me everywhere at I am Ralph Sutton. My other podcast, the SDR show comes out every Wednesday, every Saturday. We just had, which I think I mentioned last week, uh, the free episode that's out right now. One of the biggest rock bands in the world, which is Shine Down, Super cool dudes. And uh, Chris Catan from SNL was just on as well. Really good, good dude. Uh, but you can follow me everywhere at I am Ralph Sutton. And that is the SDR show is available anywhere you would listen or watch a podcast. I have something in the plug. Really? It's going to be, my wife uh, is great. Oh. No, 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 no. Next uh, show, we're really happy that uh, that Rittenhouse kid that uh, That's great. killed really those two job. people are going to be on the show. Way, way to uh, end the show classy. Is it, is, it, is it too soon? You think? I don't know. I, it's funny, though. I knew he was going to get acquitted. I can tell you that. Well, 
you know what? We don't get political. I would say that uh, it's none of my fucking business. Well, you brought it up, sunshine. All right, we'll see you next week on GSP, the Good Trigger Podcast.